Do you really think this is going to help? How would you tell people that this is You first, first, first. How would you tell this? Well, interesting question. I don't know. I don't know. I'm research on that. Hey there YouTube, the Dapper Dinosaur here, back again to look at the lies of the Institute for Creation Research as told by Drs. Thomas and Clary. I'm not going to stand on ceremony this time, so take it away, doctors. Yeah, because to, to, do, to do that transformation, mm -hmm. you have to reorganize like mm -hmm. all the organs, all the organ systems, the cells, mm -hmm. uh, because... Because um, of uh, what? What does it even mean that you have to reorganize the organs and cells? What do you think, birds have their lungs in their feet or something? Are their muscle cells push instead of pull cells like in all other animals? What are we talking about? And even proteins, specific individual mm -hmm. proteins mm -hmm. within cells. Oh, I was unaware that Dr. Thomas has an extensive list of protein sequences for non-avian dinosaurs to compare to bird sequences. But also, isn't it interesting that when Dr. Schweitzer found molecular fossil remnants of T. rex collagen and she sequenced it, the closest match she could find to that was in ostriches. Hmm. So we have Dr. Thomas making a claim that dinosaur proteins are far too different to turn into bird proteins without even bothering to check. And we have a real scientist, and a Christian I might add, Dr. Schweitzer, actually testing the hypothesis and finding that in the one case we can test, dinosaur protein is actually closest to bird protein. Weird that. Because your metabolism mm -hmm. is integrated at all these different organs mm -hmm. and organ systems and different levels of organization within, mm -hmm. within a creature. Okay, but we haven't heard a single good reason to assume that non-avian dinosaurs had slow metabolisms compared to modern birds. Uh, so to so, yeah, for I think for evolution or natural processes to make all those coordinated changes that would be required to mm -hmm. go from cold to warm, mm -hmm. blooded metabolism, I think it's just a joke. At a basic level. The only real difference between ectothermy, mesothermy, and endothermy is metabolic rate. We know that even varies within a species. For instance, you can find humans who will put on weight after a single day of overeating and need to carefully monitor their calorie intake or they will be overweight. On the other hand, you can find humans who stay skinny even after eating multiple pizzas and washing that down with cake and soda. That's a difference in baseline metabolic rate. Nothing about increasing metabolic rate is hard for evolution. And since evolution isn't a process of giant leaps but is relatively gradual, even under punctuated equilibrium, the various aspects of biology like protein sequence and turbinates and insulation that tend to come along with endothermy can evolve during the mesothermic stage. Nothing here is a problem for evolution, but further, remember, even if it were, we still have reason to think that mesothermy and endothermy were common in dinosaurs, and no reason to think that ectothermy was ubiquitous among them, like these two insist. Mm -hmm. I think it's a joke. As a biochemist, I have one of my degrees mm -hmm. is biochemistry. So. So, not paleontology, organismal biology, or evolutionary biology. You know, the relevant fields. Got it. From that perspective, I'm, I'm looking at it from that, from that lens mm -hmm. going, well, you'd have to change. You'd have to change everything. You'd have to do a wholesale mm -hmm. rewrite. Mm -hmm. That's going to be a big old citation needed, my man. But did dinosaurs, did any of them have feathers? You hear this a lot in the creation community now as well. Yes, in addition to crown birds, over 50 dinosaur genera are known to have had feathers from direct evidence, including the aforementioned, by these two, Cynoceropteryx, but also Dylon, Colindodromius, Ornithomimus, Eutyranus, Cetacosaurus, and Velociraptor, and many others. Uh, you, know, you see this all the time in the news, dinosaur, new feather dinosaur, new feather this, new feather that, and we're constantly writing news articles saying, okay, if you read through the article, what does the article really say? It says that a dinosaur was discovered with direct evidence of feathers. Well, let me start with sort of a few anecdotes. Okay. That's more fun to talk about than okay. articles. Uh, <laughs> One trick is to tell them stories that don't go anywhere. Like the time I caught the ferry over to Shelbyville. But it did start with an article. My anecdote is that... Uh, I needed a new heel for my shoe. I went to a museum in San Antonio. Mm -hmm. So I decided to go to Morganville which is what they call Shelbyville in those days. And it showed a T-Rex model, a small T-Rex, absolutely covered with feathers. Yeah, why bother talking about a taxon with direct evidence of feathers in the same group of Tyrannosauroidea, like Dialong or Eutyrannus? Instead, let's focus on a taxon for which we have no known feather remains, but that it is phylogenetically possible to have had feathers. We wouldn't want to talk about the direct evidence of feathers, now would we? It looked ridiculous. 
<laughs> but maybe that's what it was, you know? I, who am I to say I wasn't there? Turns out many animals look ridiculous to humans. That doesn't mean they don't or didn't exist. Mm -hmm. But it just didn't seem to fit. And it was just covered with feathers. And of course, they put, you know, lots of colored feathers. As opposed to what? Clear feathers? That's not really much of a thing. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of, a lot of folks out there who believe that, that even some of the Tyrannosaurids, the smaller mm -hmm. ones maybe, had feathers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but only because we've, you know, found the feathers. And some of the evidence for that would be like these fibers that they found associated mm -hmm. with the skeletons in the fossil record. Ah, yes, those fibers with preserved melanosomes, like the ones he accepts in Sinoceropteryx, which preclude them from being collagen frank because collagen doesn't have melanosomes. Only integumentary structures like hair, scale, feathers, and skin have those. Mm -hmm. and, um, but other evolutionists have come along and said those fibers really look to us like decayed skin fibers. Because mm -hmm. when your skin decays, it turns into little fibers. No, they don't, and no, it doesn't. What can turn into fibers is collagen. Skin as a whole just rots away. And the only people saying that are Fiducia and company, and they're no longer taken seriously because, as I already mentioned, these fibers are fundamentally incompatible with the identification as collagen fibers because they have melanosomes, and collagen doesn't. But further, I see what Thomas is doing in just pretending that collagen is synonymous with skin so he can pretend that the fibers are skin fibers because skin does have melanosomes. So he's not just wrong, he's dishonest. Of course, if Dr. Thomas would like to contact me to let me know that he is in fact simply ignorant of the difference between skin and collagen, he may. I'd be happy to find that he's simply an ignoramus instead of a liar. So so some folks turn those fibers into feathers. Well, does T-Rex mm -hmm. have feathers or not? I think probably not, at least as an adult. It was big enough to not really need them, rather like an elephant, which is an animal that's mostly naked because it doesn't really need fur to keep it warm. Well, just a few years ago, mm -hmm. another researcher went to actual preserved skin on mm -hmm. T-Rexes, and he found skin from the tail, which I saw mm -hmm. at the uh, Museum of the Rockies in Bozeman. They've got this huge 30-foot-long T-Rex tail, original out of the ground, on display, um, and it's got, what, skin that's sucked right down onto the bone, because mm -hmm. that's what happens when a carcass sort of mm -hmm. mummifies. Um, and that skin is covered with bumps, reptile scales, mm -hmm. no feathers on the tail. Actually, the scales known for T-Rex are reticulate, which means they're consistent with the scales found on bird feet, not the scales of lizards or snakes. But we also have skin impressions from several parts of T-Rex. Unfortunately, they're all from parts that are not the parts most likely to have had feathers, since feathers are not a whole body-wide phenomenon, even in modern birds. The parts most likely in known dinosaurs to lack feathers are the ventral side, the thighs, and in some cases, the tail. The parts most likely to have had feathers are the dorsal side of the torso, and to some extent, the dorsal portions of the head and neck, although that's less likely than just the torso. Those areas are where we don't have impressions of skin. So while we can't say for certain if Tyrannosaurus had feathers, we can say that where we can check, it did not, and it's big enough to make them unnecessary. But also, the places it was most likely to have them, we don't have skin impressions yet. But I still come down on the side of thinking it probably did not have feathers, at least as an adult. And other specimens, mm -hmm. actual from the rock, mm -hmm. not speculations about fibers and feathers, show uh, from its belly, from its head, from every major body part, Except the dorsal side of the head, neck, and torso. You know, the places most likely to be feathered. T-Rex was scaly, skin, scaly, skin, scaly, skin. So the whole... So then I was like, okay, T-Rex did not have feathers. That conclusion stated as a fact is in no way warranted by the evidence. I happen to think it didn't, but that doesn't mean it didn't. We don't have enough evidence to be definitive either way. So then, so then I'm like, well, what else are they saying had feathers? but the best science shows it was not feathers. I like the phrase, what else? As if he had found an animal for which the consensus opinion is that it was feathered, but he's found contrary evidence. He found evidence that made him reject the still uncertain possibility that a single genus had feathers without that evidence being conclusive, and now he's just pretending that T-Rex being feathered is the consensus view, and that someone is suppressing these skin impressions or something, and that the dinosaurs that are actually known to be feathered are similarly the subject of some conspiracy. And I know he didn't explicitly say there's a conspiracy, but if there's evidence sufficient to refute the consensus on integumentary structures of known dinosaurs and no one is talking about it, that's what it would have to be, a conspiracy. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I have not yet seen a feathered dinosaur. A truly dinosaur feathered beings, dinosaur. Open acetabulum, right. mm -hmm. uh, open hip bone, mm -hmm. that's a dinosaur. And then feathers on that. I haven't seen that yet, so I'm waiting to see that. Oh, so like every bird, but also like the ones I mentioned earlier, 
I'm sorry he's never looked at Velociraptor, except I really doubt that's the case. I think he's just in denial. Well, about so a year or two ago, they actually did a big study of the Tyrannosaurs, and they said Tyrannosaurs didn't have feathers. Who are they? What study? When? Where was it published? And of course, what do you mean by Tyrannosaur? Do you mean Tyrannosaurine? Because, yeah, probably not. Do you mean Tyrannosauridae? Because that's less certain, but I'd still be surprised if any Tyrannosaurids were feathery, at least as adults. Do you mean Eutyrannosauria? Because there's a fair chance some of them had feathers. Do you mean Pantyrannosauria or Tyrannosauroidea? Because we know for a fact many of those had feathers. Turns out Tyrannosaur isn't a word that means much. But all the other theropods did. What? No one says that. We know that many Ceratosaurs didn't, including Ceratosaurus as well as abelosaurids like Carnotaurus, Rugops, and Majungasaurus. Feathers are almost certainly basal to the theropoda, but they certainly weren't found in all members of the group. Because yeah, they, they know they did, because they turned into birds. No, we know that some definitely did not, but as you get closer and closer to modern birds in terms of anatomy, you get more and more evidence of feathers, and the feathers are more and more similar to modern flight and contour feathers the closer in anatomy you get to birds. So that by the time you're at Deinonychosauria, you have animals with feathers that are essentially identical to modern bird feathers, even though you're still a good way away from crown avies. Right. But they actually did a study, probably using that specimen you talked about, and others, and, and they determined that dinosaurs, the T-Rex type, the, you know, the theropods of the Tyrannosaur family, didn't have feathers. You sure it was a study? You sure it wasn't, you know, nothing? But even if it were a study, something we have no evidence for, it's already known that it's quite likely that Tyrannosaurids were too big to need insulation as adults, so it would be no surprise if they lacked feathers. But they think, you know, well, maybe they when they're really young or... Yeah, when they were small and so needed insulation because gigantothermy isn't useful if you're not gigantic. And Tyrannosaurids started out pretty darn small. But is there direct evidence of this in juvenile Tyrannosaurids? No, there is not. We just know that feathers would have had a use, and a presence of feathers is phylogenetically plausible given the animals we know for a fact did have feathers, because again, we found the feathers. Or other, but other ones do. They always put them on Velociraptor. They love to put feathers on Velociraptor, but there's really very little evidence of any feathers on a Velociraptor. You know, except for those ulnar quill knobs, which are kind of like finding a tooth socket on a skull. If you find a skull with a tooth socket, you know the skull had teeth at one point. If you find quill knobs on an ulna, you know the ulna had quills at one point. And what are quills? Oh, that's right. They're feathers. Also, never mind that we have full plumage preserved for Microraptor, which is in the same family as Velociraptor. Presumably, that would make it in the same kind, since we're just pretending that the family level of taxonomy is a real thing in the world of biology, independent of humans arbitrarily defining them. They're really kind of pushing the envelope. It's almost where they're writing science fiction and calling that science. Yeah, nothing says sci-fi like looking at the actual anatomy of an animal and concluding that it did in fact have the evident anatomy Total fantasy land. I think so. And yeah, in order to mm -hmm. get your dinosaur into a bird, you got to mm -hmm. make it warm blooded mm -hmm. and you got to put feathers on it. Right. Well, mission accomplished then. We have conclusive evidence of both and at least some dinosaurs. And we have extremely strong evidence that warm bloodedness goes back before dinosauria and even some evidence that feathers might as well. So we're finding fibers and turning those into mm -hmm. feathers and we're finding active mm -hmm. movement, anatomy of active motion, mm -hmm. which we associate with warm-bloodedness, we, and we make them warm-blooded. So we're trying mm -hmm. to turn them into, yeah. evolutionists are trying to turn these creatures into birds. Nope, they're confirming predictions based on the hypothesis that birds are dinosaurs, by observing exactly what Dr. Thomas just confirmed they're observing, but also by observing far more than that, like actual panaceous feathers and bone histology indicative of a metabolic rate consistent with endothermy. Sorry that doesn't fit with Dr. Thomas's pre-concluded beliefs, but science doesn't care, because remember, Starting with a conclusion is the opposite of science, and Dr. Thomas is an anti-scientist. Um, but um, if you remove that bias, mm -hmm. what you have is the actual data, and it shows it, in the rocks we've got um, birds separate. Mm. <laughs> okay, okay, tell you what, Brian. You tell me which of these groups is where we can say we have birds. Manoraptora, Paravis, Aviale, Pigostylia, Ornithorhasis, Ornithoromorpha, Ornithore, or crown birds. At the least bird-like end, we have animals with bird-like feathers and wrists, but that's about it. Then in Paravis, we have wings that are more specialized for aerodynamics, but still have unfused wing fingers. Then we have Picostylia, where we get shortened bird-like tails. Then in Ornithorhesis, we get the keeled sternum, and in Ornithoromorpha, 
we're getting the fused wing fingers, and then finally in Ornithora, we're losing teeth. Where do birds start? Is Velociraptor a bird? What about Archaeopteryx, which has a skeleton almost identical to Velociraptor? How about Jeholornis? Sapiornis? Hesperornis? Also, which ones aren't dinosaurs? Because they all have open acetabula, non-sprawling legs, syncacra, and all the other diagnostic features of dinosaurs. It's actually impossible to draw a non-arbitrary line between birds and dinosaurs, just like it is between humans and apes, because birds are dinosaurs and humans are apes. Dinosaurs separate from birds. Anatomy is different. That's the same argument one could use to say that whales aren't mammals, even though they definitely are. Being unusual among a group doesn't make you not part of the group. Whales are unusual ungulates, but they're ungulates. Birds are unusual dinosaurs, but they're dinosaurs. Humans are unusual apes, but they're apes. Mm -hmm. uh, feathers in the birds, and no bona fide feathers yet for the dinosaurs right. that I've seen. Right. Maybe open your f***ing eyes then. You don't get to ignore the evidence staring you in the face and then act like it wasn't there, and then back it up by lying about bird hips. And, there, and there's a lot of the dinosaurs that they're saying have feathers are actually birds, based on the yeah, anatomy. They call, it, they call it a bird, and guys, that's a dinosaur, and yeah. vice versa. Mm -hmm. If birds are dinosaurs, then of course you can call a bird a dinosaur. And if you want to dispute this, you could, you know, show how birds don't meet the definition of a dinosaur. As for calling non-bird dinosaurs birds, well, I don't know where to draw that line, and we haven't even heard an attempt from these two clowns, so it seems like it's a hard line to draw. Kind of like how creationists can't figure out which fossil apes are humans and which ones aren't. So they all just give different answers, and some of them even give different answers from the answers that they themselves had previously given. You know, Microraptor mm -hmm. is a four-winged, feathered dinosaur. Yes, it's not even an aviale, which is the broadest category which I've ever heard called birds. It's in Dromaeosauridae, the family of Velociraptor and Deinonychus. Well, you know what? If it's got four wings and feathers, mm -hmm. we could call it a bird. <laughs> Except, you know, it doesn't have a beak, it has teeth, it has unfused wing fingers, it doesn't have a bird-like coracoid or sternum, it doesn't have a picostyle, or an alula. All characteristics of things we today would call a bird. Weird that. It does, though, have a skeleton that's almost identical to Velociraptor, including the big killer claw on Pest Digit 2. It's almost like it's a wonderful transitional fossil, demonstrating an intermediate morphology between animals like Tyrannosauroids and animals like birds. <laughs> especially since... Especially since we don't have the, uh, the you know, the, um, the, the acetabulum. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, uh, the, uh, the f*** did you just say? We don't have Microraptor acetabula? Since when? Microraptor is known from several nearly complete fossils that include the entire sacrum. We absolutely have its acetabulum. And like all birds and all other dinosaurs, the acetabula are open. Brian. Stop lying about dinosaurs. It's obvious and frankly offensive. And at this point, even you don't know what you're talking about. You're deceptively pretending that you do. So ignorance is no longer an excuse. Um, it's a it's a bird. Mm -hmm. Ask It's a bird. Yeah. My director was a bird. And so let's just call it what it is. Right. It had a dinosaur acetabulum. Cool. If you want to say that Velociraptor was a bird, that's weird and no one will agree with you except for some pseudo and anti-scientists, but... Whatever. All right, is it possible, do you think, to clone a dinosaur? A bird? Yes. Other dinosaurs? No. We don't have any remaining sequenceable DNA from dinosaurs, nor do we have eggs which would reliably be able to carry a growing embryo to term. And the thing is, they largely agree with me. So although they pretend that dinosaurs are young enough that maybe we could find their DNA, but since for the most part we all agree the answer is basically no, there's no real reason to include their answer. But, and we show that they probably were different than birds, just like we've been saying all along. No, that wasn't shown. It was claimed, and then outright falsehoods were used to back it up. Well, one thing that just came to my mind that I wanted to mention, from as a geology standpoint, and what's often neglected with the turn into dinosaurs, trying to make dinosaurs turn into birds, is you have dinosaurs here in the rock record, and you have birds down here. You know, the if humans evolved from monkeys, then why are there still monkeys question doesn't become a good objection just because you apply it to birds and other dinosaurs instead of humans and other monkeys. Birds evolved from dinosaurs as one branch of the family tree. The other branches didn't go extinct just because birds had evolved. It makes just as much sense to ask if birds are reptiles, then why are there still lizards? The dinosaurs that didn't evolve into birds, which by the way is literally all of them but one species, didn't evolve into birds. So they're not birds. And that's why we find non-bird dinosaurs after birds evolve. This whole point is just as stupid as saying, well, if Anglo-Americans came from Europe, then why are there still Europeans, hmm? along with the dinosaurs, but the most bird-like dinosaurs are up here, and then in the, you know, in the Cretaceous rocks, 
Except no, some very bird-like dinosaurs are found in the Jurassic, like Archaeopteryx. It's just that there are some exceptional formations in Cretaceous rocks in China that preserve a wide range of Paravian dinosaurs. That is, the dinosaurs including birds that are most like birds. There is no temporal paradox here. The last the dinosaur rock layers, you get them in the kind of get them in the mid to late Triassic, and then you get some dinosaurs in the Jurassic layers, and then you get dinosaurs in the Cretaceous, and they all kind of disappear. But the most bird-like ones that claim that dinosaurs are supposedly turned into birds are the ones in the upper Cretaceous. Well, we have feathered birds called Archaeopteryx down in the upper Jurassic layers. Funny thing, though. Archaeopteryx lacks an inverted hallux, a keeled sternum, a picostyle, a beak, fused fingers, fused metatarsal bones, and it still has teeth. And it has a basal coracoid bone. So by most definitions, including the classical one from Linnaeus, Archaeopteryx isn't a bird. It's below the dinosaur. No, Brian. Below some dinosaurs and above others. You know, the thing we'd expect. How could birds evolve from dinosaurs and be either the first dinosaurs or come after dinosaurs had gone extinct? That doesn't make sense. The only god possibility for finding fossil birds at the base of the bird family tree is to find them somewhere between those things. This is like 8th grade biology level stuff here. Basic logic should be enough for you to puzzle this out. If A comes from and is part of B, then can A originate before B? No, of course not. Can it originate after B is gone? No, of course not. It has to, of logical necessity, come about while B is still around, and therefore both A and not A members of class B will be around together for at least some time. I can't believe I have to explain this to two grown men, let alone two PhDs. I refuse to believe that these two are this empty-headed. This is actually giving me a tension headache. You two are supposed to be pretending to be scientists. Do at least a bit better than Kent Hovind. These two are denying reality at the same level as basic arithmetic. This makes no more sense than being skeptical that one and one really sum to two. But then again, is it really any surprise that creationists tend to abandon basic logic? Which would be, you know, 50 million in the, in the secular worldview, 50 to 70 million years before these dinosaurs were most bird-like. Yup. And that is the biggest problem, in my opinion, is the rocks, again, support... You have birds, you have dinosaurs. You got some birds that couldn't fly as well like Archaeopteryx. They've been doing studies and show that Archaeopteryx flew like a pheasant. So it couldn't stay above the water as long as some birds and soar and soar had to land. And so these dinosaur or these birds got buried in with the dinosaur rocks earlier than many of the other birds that showed up, you know, later in the rock record, because they just couldn't fly as well. These bony tailed birds that are now extinct today are really couldn't couldn't fly as well. And so they're caught in there, but You've got birds already, why would they re-evolve later? Dude, Mr. Clary, you already said that birds in the Jurassic were not as bird-like as the ones in the Cretaceous. That's exactly what evolution would predict. What are you talking about with this being a problem for evolution? You just described precisely what we'd expect if birds broadly defined diverged in the Jurassic period. Also, in terms of flying, and since ICR, I think that nearly all of the Cenozoic is flood rock, why is it the birds that managed to fly until the Cenozoic rocks were being deposited, weren't joined by any similarly built pterosaurs. Why no Paleogene pteranodon, but we do find flightless birds in the Paleogene? Why did their wings shrink mid-flight and then the poor pteranodons were struck down by God specifically targeting them with lightning? Because, I don't know, maybe pterosaurs are just blasphemous in their own right? What's the model for this? Of course, I know this question will never be answered, not just because these two aren't likely to watch this, but because even if they did, they have no answer. You know, yeah. why would you evolve them twice? You've already got these birds. And that's often neglected in this story that the secular world is spinning out there. The narrative that birds evolved twice? No one is spinning that narrative, nor is there any evidence of it. That's just two dunderhead creationists badly misinterpreting the fossil record and just basic logic at best. Or lying at worst. Oh, dinosaurs are warm-blooded. Dinosaurs are birds. Blah, blah, blah. But, well, how do you explain that you've already got birds way below in the rocks down buried earlier in the flood? than the most bird-like dinosaurs. And even those bird-like dinosaurs have the wrong kind of hips. With the kind of basic logic that we teach in second grade, Mr. Clary, that's how. And also, you two have lied about dinosaur hips and bird hips specifically, so I don't even know how to answer your question there because it's obviously not being asked in good faith. You know, they balance differently, as you pointed out. The, if you kind of pull their legs down to make them walk like a dinosaur, these birds that have feathers, they'd fall over. Even in modern birds, that's just a function of tail length. Here's a clip of what happens when you stick a plunger onto the butt of a chicken. Those tumors come right down like any long-tailed dinosaur. 
And by the way, Archaeopteryx had a tail long enough to be an effective counterweight, so its femur would have been held more like Tyrannosaurus than like a chicken's. And Dave Menton has actually mentioned that as well and pointed it out to me the first time, and then you've affirmed that in your description. Yeah, when birds walk, they, they, walk they move from their knees. Mm -hmm. But when dinosaurs walk, they moved mm -hmm. at the hips. Like the but thighs, are, yeah, the thighs, the thighs are kind of inside on your chickens and stuff. Yeah, the thighs are more rigid to hold to hold the uh, to hold its shape, to hold those air sacs on the inside. And so. I've already covered Menton's mendacious, meandering speech from the Answers in Genesis. It's basically all wrong. A conclusion shared by actual dinosaur paleontologist and real scientist Darren Nish, as he expressed in the takedown of the same talk that he did with Arn Ra. I've linked my series breakdown above, and I'm sure you'll have no trouble finding Roz. So if you pull the legs down and walk like a dinosaur does, they'd fall over. They'd be too front heavy. Front heavy, yeah. And so it's it's difficult. It's it's more difficult than they make it out to be. They just think, oh, if you change a little bone here and there, and you got it. What he's describing is literally just pulling the knee up more as the tail shortens. It doesn't even require the femur to change at all. Just the customary angle it's held at. But like you said earlier, they forget all the physiological changes that have to come along with it as well. There's yeah, many things. Yeah, a whole of changes so we had, at the same time. We it have, just doesn't happen. It does so because all parts of a creature are under selective pressure simultaneously. So while wings are developing, a sternal keel is also developing. And while the knee is becoming the dominant locomotor joint for walking and running, the metatarsals can develop their fused state. That's just how evolution works. You can't dismiss evolution by saying evolution would have to happen the way it's supposed to in order for evolution to happen. You might as well say you reject gravity because objects accelerate as they fall. Yeah, we know. That's kind of the point. Right, we have feathered extinct birds with bony tails like Capyopteryx and Microraptor. And then we have, to, to our recollection, to our knowledge today, there are no feathered dinosaurs. You know, except for birds. Which, remember, Messrs. Thomas and Clary have given us no reason to think aren't dinosaurs other than just outright falsehoods. Everything we see is skin, scaly skin, scaly skin, scaly skin. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of scaly skin dinosaurs that you can see the replicas of, including the T-Rexes. Yeah, you know if you just ignore all the other dinosaurs like Ovaraptorosaurs, Ornithomimosaurs, Cynoceropteryx, Heterodontosaurs, and Ceratopsians, to name just a few for which direct and indirect evidence of feathers has been found. All right, our last question. We're getting there. And this is your expertise. This is what you got your PhD in. So, Mr. Thomas will have no excuse here. What's so important about finding soft tissues in dinosaur fossils? Well, so the, give us your dissertation in a nutshell. Yeah, right. <laughs> it seems pretty obvious that what's important is that it opens up a whole new field of data that we might previously not even have known existed. While the study of soft tissue remnants and molecular fossils is in its infancy, so exactly what we can learn is still up in the air. The possibilities are huge. Just the fact that we've confirmed that Tyrannosaurus collagen is very similar to bird collagen is amazing and a wonderful confirmation of the fact that birds are dinosaurs. But let's hear Brian screw it up by lying about what it implies for the age of fossils. When you say tissues, you're not mm -hmm. talking about Kleenex. You're talking about like mm -hmm. blood vessels and mm -hmm. uh, connective tissue, like actual tissue, including cells. Osteocyte cells, cells, yeah. No actual blood vessels or cells have been found residue of them that's still in roughly the original shape has been found. Not just osteocyte, but uh, other cells too. And um, boy, that that's not supposed to be in any kind of, you know, any kind of fossil mm. that's, that's a million years old or more. Mm. Or so we thought. Then we found mechanisms to cross-link proteins naturally during fossilization, as well as finding that some of the molecular fossils are actually degraded versions of proteins that are so stable that they have an effectively infinite shelf life. Interestingly enough, humans had already been using cross-linking to preserve organic tissue in not the same state as life, but close enough that it can be studied or used. Cross-linking is how the protein in skin can be preserved to create tough and long-lasting leather. Similarly, formaldehyde that is used to preserve biological samples preserves exactly by cross-linking. Dr. Schweitzer herself found experimentally that iron in blood can provide cross-linking for protein in fossil bone, thereby preserving segments of protein including some of their mechanical properties. But in no way are the proteins, blood vessels, or cells in these finds simply intact. What we've been saying is that the flood... The flood that we know for a fact didn't happen. Right. Off to a great start. The flood deposited these layers 4,500 or so years ago. All these layers. Mm -hmm. And so, the di including the dinosaur layers. Mm -hmm. And so, if that's the case... Then the rock types would be sorted by density, with the highest at the bottom and the lowest at the top, and organisms would themselves be graded in the sediment by hydrodynamic properties. Also, we would find absolutely no subaerial deposits, and absolute testing for age would return either consistently the same age or essentially random ages, depending on whether this conspiracy theory invalidates nuclear physics to somehow make radiometric dating not work. Unfortunately, none of this is what we see. 
which is how we know that there was no global flood. But continue, Brian. Um, then maybe there's some, maybe there's tissue in there mm -hmm. that could have lasted for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. And we know that certain proteins can last, mm -hmm. tissues are made of proteins, mm -hmm. can last thousands of years. Cool, so go find an intact protein in a dinosaur bone and make sure you show your work, unlike Mark Armitage, who was allergic to actually having proper method sections in his papers. Um, but they can't last a million at uh, you know at Earth's surface temperatures. You'd have to get it liquid that, nitrogen that, to get and that, it. That's even under ideal conditions. Hence why we don't have any intact Mesozoic dinosaur proteins. It's ideal. Unlike what's exposed, like in Montana, we got freeze and thaw, freeze and thaw, right near the surface, water trickling in. Bacteria you action. Know, it's, yeah, so life is rough mm -hmm. for a protein underground. Uh, Good thing some of them got cross-linked or decay into staloforms so that they can get the remnants of them today. And, and mm -hmm. with more time, you know, there's more opportunities for chemistry mm -hmm. to happen and for bacteria to, de mm -hmm. to uh, degrade it and for chemistry to decay it. So, um, and then there's radiation that mm -hmm. breaks apart these molecules, but they're still inside the bones, which makes us think that, hey, the flood got it right, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, let's forget everything we know about physics, astronomy, radiation, geology, taphonomy, sedimentology, genetics, etc. Or maybe there are some new preservation mechanisms to discover. I wonder which of those is more likely. We're wrong about basically all of science, or we have a bit more to learn about protein cross-linking. Hmm, big conundrum there. The flood really is, is the explanation for how you get fossils in the first place, how you get rock layers, and how you get tissues still in them. It's because it's recent. Mm -hmm. So to me, this says the Bible got it right. Too bad the only evidence we have concerning a global flood is direct evidence that it didn't happen. If the Bible's right about where we came from, then it's right about who we are mm -hmm. and our need for a savior. Yeah, maybe don't tie your theology to a demonstrably wrong interpretation of Genesis. Or do and be wrong. It's not my life you're wasting. But if there's a God you're going to answer to, he might not be happy that you spent your life lying about science while pretending to do it for him. The rest of their talk is just preaching. I'm going to assume my whole audience is reasonably familiar with the theology of fundamentalist evangelical Protestantism. If you're not, feel free to look into it elsewhere. Well, I hope you enjoyed that video with Drs. Thomas and Clary talking about dinosaurs. Robert, I did not in fact enjoy it. It was infuriatingly inaccurate and in ways I have trouble assuming were honest mistakes given the education of the two speakers. If your question didn't get answered, you can pick up a creation Q&A booklet by going to store.icr.org. I would rather stick screws into my fingers, but okay, that's it for this series, everybody. It's still nearly incomprehensible to me how badly wrong creationists will get dinosaurs, and for very little reason. They could just accept that birds are dinosaurs and say that they died off right after the flood. Sure, the second part still makes God look incompetent, but honestly, the whole flood does that anyway, if you take it literally. Oh well. Please remember to subscribe to the channel and to turn on the bell icon and choose all notifications so you're always notified when I have new content. If you like this video, hit like and leave a comment telling me what you enjoyed. If you didn't like it, feel free to dislike the video and tell me what your problems are with it. Either way, I hope to see you again. I'm the Dapper Dinosaur. Thanks for watching, but before you go, I just want to say a special thank you to my channel members and my patrons, especially those pledging $20 or above. Bob Knob, Work in Progress, Van Toven, Tapioca Weasel, Denny5252, Ian Chen, Landon Knoll, Mabdi Babdi, McSpooks, Sphincter of Doom, The Venerable Bead, and Atheist Animal. As you probably know, YouTube is a very volatile platform, and from month to month, my income on the channel can swing wildly. But the people you see on screen are directly supporting so that I don't have to worry too much about that, and the channel can keep going as it is, and perhaps even improving. If you'd like to join this team, there are links below to join the channel or in the description to join the Patreon. The Patreon starts as low as $1 a month, and the channel memberships start as low as $1.99 a month. On Patreon, you can even get a discount for pledging annually. If you do decide to pledge, you'll get access to an exclusive Discord server just for channel supporters, as well as early access to all of my pre-recorded videos, often up to two months in advance. Higher tiers will unlock even better perks. Now, if an annual or monthly pledge isn't right for you, but you still want to support the channel, there is a merch store down in the description, as well as an Amazon wishlist, just for me. And if financial support isn't something you can or want to do, then if you still want to help out the channel, please just like and share these videos and make sure you comment on them. It really helps the channel out. Thanks again for watching.